Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to show you is just what it's going to look like. So the end product we're going to build is this map. This is D3, it's a population map that shows you the population by ward of South Africa. Um, it's zoomable, you can grab it, you can move it. Um, and I'm going to take you through the process of building that particular map. So, the first thing you need to do is you need to get some data. So you need to have a shape file, you need to have a file that has all of those little ward uh, icons in it. You need to have something that basically puts together the map um, of South Africa down to the ward level. Now to get that you need to go to the website. There's a couple of places. I've seen some on Open Data, data Africa. I've seen some on Census SA, uh, Stats SA. But the, the, the official place is the demarcation board. So if we go to the demarcation board, where are we? No. Demarcation board is there. This website was broken up until about half an hour ago. It just suddenly started working for the last two days. It hasn't been live. <laughs> so I had downloaded the stuff prior. Um, but on the demarcations board, you can get to download, boundary data, uh, boundary data main files, the wards, and you can, those are all the wards for South Africa. So you can download that file. You can also go to provinces. The interesting thing about the way South Africa is demarcated, you've got all of South Africa, then you've got provinces, then you've got districts, no, local municipalities, that's divided into districts, and below that is wards. Wards is what you use from a voting perspective, so that's the minimum amount that the demarcation board keeps. Below that, you have specialized areas that Stats SA start to define, so you actually get down to suburbs and you get down to areas or, or an area of interest, they call it. So there is more detail, but that you can't get off the demarcations board, so that's where I'm going to start here. And, Yes. Um, just a point. There's a website called Planet Geopolis. Yes. Um, they actually got some data from the future state and some data from the data from the future state. Okay, for South Africa. Okay. The other one I used at one point. Another one. Um, Code for South Africa also has the uh, ward and provincial level uh, shape, um, uh, GeoJSON and top of JSON files. So if you don't want to get the shape files, you can actually get the direct top of JSON and GeoJSON from Code for OSA. Or I'll show you how to make a topo JSON file. Okay, so in Can I also mention that you know this data sets now they change over time. Yes. We currently prepare it for 2016. Yeah. And some of that will change. So yes. they might not have the latest there. Yeah. It's only the official set for 2011. Yes. But for the upcoming elections we're still looking for. So the demarcations board will always publish the most recent ones. Yeah. Because no, they sorry, you know, they will probably also at some stage have a link towards uh, the 2016 demarcation yeah. is a work in progress. By law, it will be official on the day of the next election. We don't know when, which one it is. It will be finalized. Okay. Like those cases where there is a metro here in additional metro or city venues get established, some municipalities have been consolidated. Yeah. But for now, as you explained, the, the, the best is to use the 2011 set. Yeah. Until 2016 set is made official on the day of the election. But the official set currently sitting with the NDB. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and for this one, I needed to take current population and ward IDs, and I needed a set of uh, that, which is the 2011 census data, um, and I needed 2011 demarcations. So the demarcations board's current data set is the one that I need. There's also a place called CloudMade. There's quite a few um, data sources, but Planet GIS is one that I need. Uh, okay. So. I Right, so from the demarcations board. Now the demarcations board is going to give you a shape file. <coughs> and they're going to give you a zip file, and inside that zip file there's shape files, a couple of other different things. Now, that is only really useful from a GIS tools perspective. It's not really useful from a JavaScript perspective. So you need to convert it. There are command line tools that will do this conversion for you, but I found that uh, this site was a lot easier. They do conversion of vector files, and you can upload a shape file, and it will give you back a file of a different format. So let me just take you through the process that I went through. Uh, choose a file. So we'll do the provincial stuff because it's a bit less data. Send the zip file. They will then it uploads to them. You have nice 
faster bandwidth here today, so this is, I don't have to ramble during this bit. Um, that has now extracted the shapefile. This is the information that sits inside there. These are the attributes that are there, so if you don't need all the attributes, you can turn some on and off. We need to export it now. So we can export it to GeoJSON. So GeoJSON basically takes each of those polygons. So shapefile would say ward number 10100010. So it needs to be a ward. It's the only binary ward we have. Um, and that has a shape. It's a defined shape. It's a set of geographic coordinates. Now GeoJSON is a JSON representation of that same thing. And it represents all of the polygons. So there's about 4,700 wards in South Africa. So you get 4,700 polygons. Which there's a certain amount of inefficiency in it, which I'll explain. But this is the only option we can get off this site. So we proceed with the selected operation. And carry on proceeding. Pilot thinks about what it's doing. Okay, then we download the zip file. Okay, so that zip file has inside it a JSON file. That's a GeoJSON file. So if we have a look at that, that's 10.5 meg. That's quite a beefy file, um, and I'll show you what it looks like inside. So, and it defines the provinces, and it has a whole bunch of, it basically has polygons that defines each province. So you can see each province is individually defined. Sorry, I've just opened a 10 meg file in uh, Sublime Text. It's struggling a little. How technical is everyone here? So, am I going into areas that people don't understand when I assume that everyone knows what JSON is? Are we on familiar territory? JavaScript, Node, those type of things. If you don't know, then just if there's a particular thing that you want me to explain, just chat. So, there it is. This is a particular province, these are the coordinates, and this is a complete map of the area that it travels around. So that's the JSON file. A 10 meg file is a very big file to download over the internet, so it's not useful in its current form. The other thing that we want to do is we want to, from, from there, we want to overlay both the provinces and the wards together. Because generally people understand South Africa in terms of the provincial map. If you show them South Africa with just the wards, it doesn't look quite right because you don't have a sense of where Gauteng is, where Western Cape is. So you want to put those two together. So the next thing we want to do is we want to convert the GeoJSON and that particular exercise that I did where I took the um, the, went and took the, the province file and did the conversion. I can also do with the wards file. But the wards are 34 meg big. It's going to take a long time. So we're going to do like they do in those cooking shows. So now I'm going to take it out, put it in the oven, close it, da -da, and it's cooked. So I've done the same thing with the ward files, which I can take you through. Um, Okay, so here is province.json and wards.json. So those are the original JSON files. And you can see that it's 10.5 meg big and 93 meg big. That's not useful from a, uh, from a utilization perspective. That's too big to do that over the web. So now we need to do two things. The first thing we need to do is we need to combine them, and then we also need to simplify them. Now the simplification process involves a piece of code called topo.json. What well, topo.json is different to geo.json. They're both JSON descriptions of an area. But topo.json, if I think of a ward that has neighbors, you actually share lines. So that you'll have ward A and ward B on next to each other. That's a shared line. But if I define that border and I define that border independently, I've got a duplication of data. And when you have a lot of little small wards, you have a lot of data duplication. So what JSON does is it defines a grid of all the lines inside it. It says if you follow this particular series of dots, it will create this ward. If you follow that particular series of dots, it will create another ward. So it's almost like a compression algorithm that works inside um, JSON so that you are able to t reduce the total amount of data that you take up to define the same thing. So Topo JSON makes the web much easier because you're not delivering such a big file, you're delivering a much smaller file. 
So <coughs> to combine the two together, we do have to go into the command line. So we have to go into, I've installed Topo JSON. You can install Topo JSON through uh, running Node, which I'm sure you know how to do. Um, and you can say, these are the two files that I have. I have, uh, I want to create za.json, my output. The, so Topo JSON, the output is to ZA, South Africa, so that's going to give me a combination of the wards.json and the province.json. Topo JSON, when it operates, automatically does the conversion from geo.json to Topo JSON. And I just set a thing to say that the main ID property is ward ID, but that's not important. That was just something I was fiddling with at the time. So I can run that, and it will create ZA.json, ZA2.json for me. Runs, thinks, does a little bit of stuff, a whole bunch of clever calculations and coding going on, possibly some calculus, and we're done. So now we have a file, which is ZA2.json, which is 6.7 meg big. So ZA2.json is my is the output, and it's still slightly big. I now need to compress it. Now, Topo JSON has the ability to simplify, and when you get to simplification of maps, it's a particularly interesting problem. There's a thing that I actually have on my list here. Uh, where are we? Let's stop presenting. Uh, called the coastline paradox. And the coastline paradox is and when you measure something on a map, the more detailed you get, the longer it gets. Because of the fact that as you start to zoom out, what actually is a squiggly line, you're putting as a straight line. So the theory and the mathematics behind going in, zooming in and zooming out of, math, of maps is quite a complex one. Um, and there's quite a lot of um, different algorithms that you can apply to it. And if you have a half an hour spare and you're waiting for a meeting, that's a particularly interesting thing to read about. Mike Bostock, who is the guy who created D3, which is the JavaScript mapping tool that we're going to talk about, has a very interesting um, online blog article that he's written about this. It gets quite deep into the mathematics, but it is quite it is particularly interesting. It has so to reduce this, we have to run it through an algorithm, and you can do this on the command line. But what I found with the command line is I don't get a sense of what it looks like. So I have to run it through the command line, then go and check and go, mm, you know what, the resolution is not great. So I found something called Map Shaper. And what Map Shaper does, let me get out of this. Map Shaper will let you do that visually. It's a bit of flash, and it basically operates on the files on your machines and on your machine and lets you do it locally. There's different algorithms. I like the original Douglas Pierke algorithm, because I do. Um, you have to say prevent shape removal. Sometimes if shapes get too small, it, the algorithm will remove them. That's problematic if you're binding data to it. So if I have provinces or if I have wards and I've removed a ward and I try and bind the data to that ward, it's going to fail. Um, repairing intersections we don't need. So from here, I can drag my file, which is ZAJSON2, and there we have it. So that is my view of South Africa. I've included provinces and wards. It hasn't highlighted the provinces yet, but we've got to a point where we can see everything. And it has a simplify function. And what I like about this is you can see as I start to simplify, it's busy simplifying, but you're not seeing any of those simplifications because they're really small. As we get all the way through, there we go. Now you can see the simplification taking place. If I told it to remove things, it would actually just become a blob, like becomes a square. Um, and Given that I know that the thing I want to visualize is around about that size, I go to the point where I'm not seeing any real changes happening. So from about 5% is where um, it usually works for me. So from my perspective, if you're blowing this up, you might actually have to have more resolution. The resolution is dependent on the size of the viewing, the, the final viewing. And we export that to Topo JSON, and now we have the file. So this file has been simplified. It contains provinces and wards and it is in topo JSON format using the official demarcations port stuff. Everyone with me so far? Cool. So, Richard, yeah. Um, yeah. should the two files uh, be in the same coordinate system? Yes. So that's why you need to get them. It's better to get them from the same place. So as long as you're using, as long as your shape files are using the, the same format, then you can um, put them together. I've not tried with ones of a different format, so I'm making an assumption. Maybe it would work with different systems, but I don't necessarily know.
Okay, so my ZAJSON file will be downloads. Okay, so there we have my official file. Place. Okay, and my code uses ZA.json, so I'm going to delete that one. Okay, so now I have the file that I need to actually start the visualization process. And it's 2.3 megs. Yeah, so it's moved from 6.7 down to 2.3. So, I mean, if we look at the, the complete data, if we were to try and use the original JSON files, that's 10 plus 93, that's really, really big. That's not viable. I've actually shrunk this down further before if I've uh, put it on sites that don't need that much resolution. Like I've got it under one meg, and the file is still work. So. Um, it really depends. You just need to, to fiddle and see, find your particular use case um, that makes the most sense. Okay, now that we have that, we need to start the process of actually building this into a website. So I'm going to start looking at the code. I'm doing this inside HTML and I'm using JavaScript. Specifically, I'm using a library called D3. D3 is made by the very amazing Mike Bostock who has the best beard, I think, of any technical person in the business. Um, he, it stands for data-driven documents. And what it is, is it's a library that allows you to bind data to something on a web page, something with, that sits within the DOM. You can have tables, you can have div tags, you can have whatever. The general use case is for SVG elements, that's why people make graphs with it, or you can do mapping. So D3 is the first library that you need to import. I'm just importing it locally, but you can go and import it directly from uh, the D3 site. I'm using something called TopoJSON, which is a specialized uh, extension to D3 that allows you to manipulate TopoJSON files. D3 by default only does GeoJSON, but they've added an, ex an extension that will allow it to do TopoJSON. And I'm using something called Q, which is also uh, by Mike Bostock, which is just a way to load a whole bunch of files, get the data in before you execute. JavaScript is notoriously asynchronous, and I've been caught a lot of times where I think something has happened um, because I put this function after that function, but it doesn't work that way. JavaScript fires everything at the same time, and sometimes you can get caught. So what Q will do is make sure everything's loaded before it will um, go ahead. Right, then I need to choose a projection. So, projections are the way that you view um, the spherical Earth on a flat format. The most common one is being something called Mercator. And I can quickly pull this up for you, um, which is a series of map projections that was done by uh, XKCD. So there is the standard Mercator. That's, I think, what Google Maps uses. And if we were at school and you had the full thing, you had the map up on the board, it was probably a Mercator map. But because of the fact that um, the Earth gets smaller, the, the radius of, of the um, latitude lines gets smaller as you go towards the poles. It's not actually an accurate reflection. The Earth is not a cylinder, it's a sphere. So there's different ways of doing projections, and there's different mathematics that is involved in converting the spherical coordinates. So if I'm in Johannesburg, and I take Johannesburg and the coordinates of various sites in Johannesburg, and I flatten them out, depending on how I do that flattening, the maths will distort and change the way it looks. So you have to pick one that you are comfortable with, that it's representing what it is that you want to represent. The most common one is Mercator, because that was the very first one that people did, and it's what people know, and it's not necessarily a good representation. It's not bad for South Africa, but it's not necessarily the, the best representation. But to start the code, uh, where are we? I used the Mercator projection. Then, you have to create a path. So there is a function, so the, the projection, I've told it that this is the mathematical function that it needs to do to take the coordinates and convert them. This part gets a bit hairy and I don't think we need to delve into this, firstly because I don't properly understand what's going on in the underpinnings of the JavaScript here. Um, and secondly, it, this is stuff that has been done so we can use it from a visualization perspective and we don't necessarily need to go unpack the code. We do know that we need to have a projection and we have to have that projection as a path. So we need to be able to take the projection, we need to give it a coordinate system, and it needs to build a set of paths for us. In D3, you have to go and select an item that sits on your web page as being the item that you're going to go and put your um, that you're going to go and put your map in. We're using scalable vector graphics for doing this mapping, and I've got a div tag, so it's a fairly simple web, uh, fairly simple site. 
I've got my body tag, I've got a div tag, that's where I'm going to put my uh, map inside. I have got my JavaScript, I specify the width and the height of it, and here I say select the tag that's SVG, put an SVG inside it, give it a width, give it a height. So now I have a container that I can put my map inside. Then I want to go and put the wards inside that, so I have in the SVG, I append something called a group. So G stands for group, so it creates a G tag inside the SVG tag, and I give it an ID of wards, and I know that I can put the wards map inside that, and I can do something similar for provinces. So for this first one, I didn't necessarily put the provinces in, um, but I, I've still got the variable, So because I, I use it at a, a later point in the presentation. So there's a function draw map which we'll come to. So this is where I use Q. There's two ways of doing this. You can use the d3.json call, which will then go and import data and execute. And the reason I have this is because I call two data sets. So when we get to the uh, importing the, the population detail, that's where Q, be Q becomes useful because you don't want uh, you don't want to have to nest them inside each other. Then we get to here. So. Um, I don't want to dive too deep into the specifics of D3. I've got some good li links in the presentation uh, as to where you can learn more about D3. But I want to go and create a whole bunch of things called wards. So I'm going to create a whole bunch of polygons that are the wards. I'm going to select all of them and I'm going to give them the class type ward map. This is my data set and this is where the D3 topo JSON comes in. Um, inside my ZA JSON data set, I will show you, we have, towards the end of it, it's pulling through big files, so it's tricky. So, there's objects, inside objects is wards and this is where it defines the different wards. So it defines it as a geometry collection and it's saying that arcs numbered 0 and 1 at the beginning of this file, that's that particular province. So it's defining where they are. And in order for me to get access to that data, I need to tell topo.json that that's the data set. So when I import it, I hand it to the function as zajson. So it has the data set, which is that map. I'm giving it the data here, that's topo.json, its feature set is that it's looking for inside ZAJSON, it's objects, wards. And it's, it knows that those are the things that are the polygons that I want to render on the page. In here, the next step is I go into the ward map and I go enter, and it binds the data, so it takes that data set, all those polygons, and binds them to everything that I've called a ward map. So it puts the two together. So it says, okay, I've got these two things. I know that this bunch of data representing that ward is bound to this path that I've now created in menu. And then here is where I have start giving it an attribute. So that's where I actually make it into a path. And a path is something that can be drawn on the screen. <clears throat> and then I give it a class. So this page, when I draw it, if we go to part one, looks like that. It's really small. So, the, and this took me a long time to figure out. I was trying to work out why it looked like that. The, this is assuming I'm zoomed out at 100%. So now we need to start zooming in on this and we need to start moving things around. So the GeoJSON, the, the, the D3 geometry functions allow you a fair amount of pliability here. I can take that and I can center it so I can choose the latitude and longitude where the center of the image is. I can choose the scale, scale makes it bigger and translate just moves it left and right. So if I move it, save the page, go, there we go, it's a bit bigger now. So this worked a little bit better when I had my screen a bit more full size. Um, if I go, minus, minus, minus. Now, this is, the, this is the Mercator projection. So the one thing that I found about this, this didn't look to me how the weather map looks. Whenever I watch the weather, it's, it, this is more elongated north-south than it is wide. So I didn't like this particular projection for no other reason than it felt slightly wrong to me. It just didn't seem like the right, particular right projection. 
So in order to get to a better projection, we can start fiddling and playing with different kinds of projections. So then we're going to move on to the next part of the, the, the building the map, which is actually the presentation. So now we've got data. We've taken our data, we've got the shape files, we've converted the shape file. We have our first map that's rendered on the screen using JavaScript. Any questions up there? Yes. What's the size of that data file right now? 2.3 meg. So I can make it smaller, but I just chose 5% resolution. Um, when I'll sh later we'll zoom in and I'll show you the sort of practicalities about it. If you don't have to zoom, you can probably actually get to do away with uh, more data. Okay, so now the next thing is we want to make this look a little bit better, look a bit prettier. So in part two, I start adding in some style sheeting. So this is just for the body to give it a background color. Um, the SVG style sheeting is slightly different, so it, you can use normal CSS for it, but the descriptors are not always exactly the same as for normal HTML. So, like text has, you use fill to describe the color of the text, not color. Um, it, you have stroke, which to, instead of border being the, the outlines of it. So, the, and it, it's fairly simple. It's just a, an attribute naming problem. It's not that the, the whole syntax is different. So here, I'm giving the full color for the ward map uh, as it's a light gray, the width, the stroke, line join, that's where the lines actually come together. Sometimes they can be jagged, sometimes they can be not. Interesting thing about uh, SVG is sometimes you'll see a blurred line. There's a, a very long and boring article about the aliasing of SVG lines between different browsers, which took me about half a day to read because it was that dull. But the, ulti the outcome of it is that as long as you add 0.5 to your line length, um, so you don't have something starting at 1, you just have it starting at 1.5, you get straight lines. There is a, a field to say you want your line type to have all your anti-aliasing to be crisp edges, and crisp edges gets very aliased, so it, go, clunk, clunk, clunk. it doesn't actually show a smooth line. So the easy way around it is just to add half, a half to whatever line you're drawing, or any box that you're drawing to make sure your SVGs are crisp. Um, okay, so I've drawn the map and I've drawn the provinces. Um, I've changed my projection to the Albers projection. Yay, Albers projection! Um, it's, I've, you can rotate, you can actually also do, you say, parallels between which two lines am I looking. The Albers projection is a weird one, kind of like, looks like that, like a, 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 a cone that's been opened up. So it is also, it's, it's slightly different, but to me it just looks better. Um, and in here I've added the provinces. Now this one part that is a bit of a gotcha, I have not done a full data set. I've done something called data. So in D3, you can bind a whole bunch of data, which is a series of arrays or a series of objects, or you can take a single data point. Now, I've extracted the provinces as a single data point, and I've used something called topojson.mesh. So dot feature takes each of the thing and draws a feature. Dot mesh takes all of the points and draws one thing. So the, for the provinces, I don't need to actually complete them. The provinces for me is an overlay on top of the map underneath. So that map that I showed you, which had all of the wards, actually is a complete representation of South Africa. We don't need to do anything else. So I just want to draw an overlay. And the benefit of doing that as a mesh is that it reduces the amount of memory that you need. So you don't have to draw all those polygons. You don't have to draw all the provinces. You can just draw a wire that sits on top of it. So if we have a look at how that looks, and go to part two. And there we go. So that is now giving the, the, the color scheme. Um, you can see I've got the provinces overlaid onto it now. It looks a little bit more like South Africa. The other thing, to, uh, it looks so different on my screen. The, this is one of those moments where I should have tested it on a projector. Um, so here we can see the sort of miniature detail of the lines. Let me make the lines a bit bigger. Uh, ward lines, let's make them important. Five. Yeah, it could be. There we go, that's a little bit good. So that gives you a little bit more detail as, as, we, um, as to the, the actual wards that are inside there. Well, I'll show, you, I'll show you how the mesh thing works. 
So if I give that a fill, of, uh, so I fill the, the provinces in, you'll see that it actually is a line. So the, the line is now, it, it basically joins in different places and that's how it creates that, that line um, of where the provinces are. What I've done is a particular bit of um, particular line in the code, which is here, as it goes through the data, it says you want things that don't overlap, that do overlap, because you want all the int internal lines. I don't want the outside map because I don't need it. It's effectively done by the wards. So if the two lines are not equal, so they're, they're overlapping but they're not from the same source, then uh, draw them. If, they, uh, if it doesn't have a... a let me think about this problem. If the lines are equal, so if they're overlapping, then draw them. If they're not overlapping, don't draw them. So the outside line, it doesn't overlap with any other part in terms of the province. So if you think about Gauteng, you go there. So it overlaps. So this part of Gauteng overlaps with that same line of, um, what is that? Sorry. Northwest. 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 Um, so there's an overlap there. So as long as they're overlapping, you draw them. If they don't overlap, don't draw them. Um, we can change that. And now it will draw all the lines on the outside and color it in. And then you have that difference. So the mesh part is... So sorry, it increases the size? No. What, what impact does it have? It then changes, so by changing that, the, so that I'm now drawing lines that don't overlap. Um, and by in doing so, <coughs> I then am drawing the outside of the circle um, because that the outside of the, the map is the only one that doesn't have overlapping lines. You don't have overlapping lines if you've got provinces touching each other. I know this isn't particularly clear, um, but it works. So, What I mean is, what, what advantage do you have? Is it on usage or...? Speed. Um, speed yeah. yeah. So you're you're using less memory by using the mesh function. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay, and we're back. Everyone good? Still happy? Comfortable? Okay. So the next part <coughs> is to take this and actually do something useful with it. Because we have maps of South Africa. Just having a nice JavaScript map isn't particularly useful. So what we want to do is do something called the Cora Pleth map. So Cora Pleth is Cora for color, and Pleth, which is the noise you make when you accidentally eat an olive thinking it's a grape. So um, <laughs> the, the most famous one of, is the Mike Bostock one, Cora Pleth map, which he did of the US. Which actually, oddly enough, has a really nice color distribution. So, I want to try and build something similar. Um, the idea I had was to take the data from the census and try and do population per ward. So, I want to build something similar that shows us where it's more densely populated, we have a more dense color. So, to get the data, I painstakingly went through interactive.stats.gov.sa because I couldn't find this anywhere. Yeah. Um, community profiles, here we go, census 2011, descriptive, okay. it's actually much better working with this website at night, because not other, there aren't other people using it. Um, you can delve in all the way down to ward level, and you hit apply. That gives you a ward identifier, which is a number, and it has the population for that ward. So I took all of that, exported it, and put it into a CSV file. And that CSV file is there. So ward and population number. And there's 40, 42,000 words. And if you have a look in my ZAJSON file, you'll have a, uh, let's get to a ward. There's a ward. So I have a ward ID. So I know that particular polygon is represented by that ward ID number. 
and I have a population. So now it's just a question of bringing the two together. So that takes us to part three. Part three is where we start adding that particular color set to it. So the first change I made is I now open another bit of data, and this one is called population.csv. Um, D3 has two ways of dealing with data. It can deal with JSON and it can deal with CSV. JSON is slightly easier to read um, and the data structures are a little bit more universal. But I found I actually export most things into CSV because the file size is smaller. JSON, the way D3 likes its JSON is it likes to have key value pairs and everything has a description. So it makes this file at least twice as big if not more when you uh, come to having data uh, when you, for the data set. Um, okay, so the next change that I've made. The other thing is I needed to pick a set of colors. So color and color theory is an interesting part of data visualization. There is a woman called Cynthia Brewer who spent a long time studying how the human brain sees color. So she spent a lot of time getting people to look at different colors and say, is this one more than that one? And what we work, usually work with is RGB, but RGB is only good for computers, it's not good for the human brain. So there's another colorless space called HSL, which is hue, saturation, and luminance. And then mathematically, it's, it, it's a lot more smoother in terms of color scales as you change between colors. She also went and worked on a whole bunch of different colors to work out which ones work best. And out of the goodness of her heart, she made it open so that we can all use it. Let's go. So whenever you're looking for Color if you're looking for a color set, you can go to the Color Bro website. Okay. So we have, uh, you can go with nine data classes, and this is sequential, which means that we're going from lowest population level to highest population level. There are different ways. Diverging means that two things that separate from the middle, and then qualitative, which would be something like people's names or uh, different types of fruit or whatever, so there's no particular relationship between them. And she's established what colors work best in terms of people's understanding of how to work with color or how we understand color. She also has options to make things like it's colorblind safe. So, okay, sorry, if you're colorblind, you can't see that particular one. Uh, let's go down to three classes, colorblind safe, printer friendly, photocopy safe. Nope, can't do that. Um, you can then, so what I took was nine scale, sequential, either printer friendly, not colorblind, safe. Uh, I think I took this one, memory serves. You can export it and actually gives you the JavaScript <coughs> code for it. So now you've got an array of the colors that you can use. Having that in there, I have a color list. So now I need to start getting my scales and getting all of those bits and pieces in place. The rest of the code is the same, but now I've added, when I draw this, I handed a, a bit of information called population. So the first thing is I need to take my population <coughs> that's in my CSV and I need to build it into a key value pair map. So D3 has a handy uh, function called ma a map, and I iterate through the population uh, variable, and I just go and set the ward name to have a particular number of population. So now I have an easily accessible variable. I don't have to go and fiddle with that CSV or that JSON representation. Then I need to say what is the maximum uh, number in that population so I can get a scale. So I need to say that the wards that have the least number of people in it need to be the, uh, the, the color that's closest to zero and the color that's closest to nine is on the other end. So there's a function inside D3 called scaling. And what it will do is it will say, this is the range that I have. So I'm operating from zero to about 90,000, which is the biggest ward population. And I need to take that and I need to quantize it and I need to give it to me in a number from one to nine. So fairly simply, well, not that simply, but the command is scale.quantize the domain. This is the um, area that I'm operating in. And the range that is the color list. So map color, if I say this ward has 20,000 people in it, what color should it be? I'm going to ask map color as the function to return that bit of information to me. So I draw my provinces as the same, no particular difference there, except when I get to world map, one of, I've added this line. So as D3 draws each of those polygons, one of the things I'm going to say to it is, now when you're drawing this polygon, you need to give it a different color. And the color 
I pass it a callback uh, function, and inside that callback function is this variable e. And what variable e is, is the data set. It's one of those data points for the ward. If we have a look here, it's going to hand it one of these. So I, I know that that is the bits of data that I have. So I have properties and I have a ward ID inside that. So three. So from the population map, I'm going to fetch the population ward ID. So at the beginning, where I set it, and I said I'm taking each of the ward IDs and I'm adding the population number to it, I'm now fetching that information. And I'm fetching it by saying which polygon am I in and what's its ward number. And based on that number, which is the population number, I'm allocating it a color. This, if you don't understand JavaScript, that probably seems quite complex. But if you are trying to get a handle on D3, you need to understand that when D3 binds a, a items to the data, it iterates through them. You don't have for loops. It's the other thing that really threw me about D3. There's no looping. You don't actually say a for loop. You don't say for all of the bits of data, do this thing. It's automatically done. So you start setting attributes, and as it goes through, it cascades. So as, it's, as I call ward map, it runs through each of the items that are inside it. And it, I'm allowed to do things to each of those items, and one of those is changing the color. The net effect of that is it looks like that. So there's map. It's now taken each of those, and we're able to um, get a sense that obviously Gauteng is quite popular. Densulate. Uh, pop Have you ever just tested something because uh, it's come across the last? Okay. It's got to be what you changed. Ah, uh, hang on. I need to change the size. Yeah. No, that's not much better. Um, you turn the brightness down on this. There we go. Okay, does that look better? Well, since we're here, let me show you the last one. And you can revel in the marvel of my somewhat uninteresting map. There we go. There we go. Back to number three. So, there is a choropleth map. The lines are now a bit thick. Let's make them thin again. We go good, better, acceptable, cool. Okay, now the the problem I had with this particular map is that there is not a lot. South Africa is actually very sparsely populated when you have a look at it, um, and the the color was mostly almost almost uniform color. So you can do some fun things with it. One of the things I did was I reversed the color set. So there is a so just before you say reverse, this color thing is what that lady told Yes. So that, that's that's a color brewer list. This is her advice. Yeah, that's her advice. Um, the like with most of these things I can either agree or not agree with her. Um, but what I I was just fiddling and seeing how other colours looked. There is a reverse function in JavaScript that will take that array and just map it the other way around. So if we run the same thing. There. So it's a slightly different version of the same map. Um, it, that probably works better on this particular environment because of the way the, the projector works. Um, if we zoom out, you can also see on the Western Cape. Um, yeah, so the, that is basically where. Yeah. Yep. Yes? Um, you said there's no loops, so. The entire function to the entire data set every time. Yes. So if you want to say run this function on 50% of the data set, you have to subset it, yep. save it again, and then run the function. Yes. One of the things that D3, I, I think, 
Sorry? Sounds like a functional. Sounds like a functional. Yes. The, yeah, D3 is, uh, there's actually something that talks about how it's programmatically different. It is more like Lisp than it is like JavaScript because of the way that you say, you give it a directive, you don't tell it the site the, to loop through it. The, um, the, the one thing that I've um, found is because of that notion, you don't ever have to know the size of your data, so you don't have to specify the size of the loop. So when you, where it becomes very useful is when you're continuously changing your data set. So if I were to change that data set to be not population, but let's say we were to uh, talk to about household income, you could, let, you could tell D3 that you have a new data set to bind to, not dimensioning it. You don't actually have to understand the size of your data set. And it will automatically go and bind, do that, that, run that same loop internally. Internally, the mechanics of it, it looks at the size of your array and builds a for loop for you. So it does some of the heavy lifting. But when you start to get to think about things in a different way and the way that D3 is designed to do it, it's, I, I found it took me a long time to get my head around that particular way of operating because I always want to have a loop. I want to do, I want to be telling it what to do rather than have it operate on its own. But once I got my head around that, it actually worked out. It made a lot more sense when you start binding to lots of different dynamic data. Quick question. On the distribution, obviously there's very sparsely populated and there's a very highly populated areas. Do you make sense to take the data and run it through a means distribution? Or do you need to try and sort of take out the groupings um, to say, like, you know, um, this area might have a very low density population and sort of trying to adapt it as opposed to the grids? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I was um, trying to do before I got here, but didn't get around to, you can do power law and you can do square root, and you can do different. Yeah. So you can do. Uh, there is log scales. There is square root scales, which is log two, um, and there's power law scales. So there are different scales, but. The problem I had was converting, I can do that in terms of numbers, but to actually get that to convert it into, to get it to extract from the list was something that I couldn't find um, today. So it, it is, an, or you just need something that's a little bit more nice and uniform. So maybe if we were to do the distribution of the letter A yeah. across the words, it would be a little bit more uniform. But that being said, the next step up from this uh, particular map. So now we've got our map. Um, if we take off the reverse, All right. so we go back to our original map. Um, it's nice, but y you don't get enough detail. So then we want to start adding the next steps. And the next steps for me was to add pan and zoom, so you can actually grab the map, move it around, zoom in, um, and then also to have a mouse over because at the moment the mouse isn't doing anything. It's just basically showing what we're doing. So part four of this is. So are these just your four steps, or is this yeah. general? No, it's my four steps. So part four is I added a tooltip. So tooltip is just a little block that will pop up as we go through, um, and I started adding a few more bits and pieces to the code. So the first thing I did was I added a zoom function. It's a handy zoom function in D3, and what it does is if it sees, um, you, you can tell it on a zoom, if you see a zoom event, this is what you need to do. So if you see a zoom event, run a function called zoomed. And then I bind that to my SVG. So if I run anything that looks like a zoom, which is scrolling with your mouse or panning with the mouse, it D3 knows that that is a zoom event and it takes that event and hands it to a function called zoomed. Now, in order to get zooming to work, I had to add in some extra layers. So where before I just created a wards uh, group, I've added a higher level group called SVG matrix. And SVGs has a function called transform. What transform does is I can tell it grow wider that way, grow wider that way, turn this way, scale in, scale out. There's different uh, functions that you can do. And there's one called matrix. And matrix basically says that this is the current size and this is the new size and apply this math mathematical function to it. So. What I do is, when I call zoomed, the D3 event has a thing called scale. It knows that I've tried to zoom in, which means I've taken a scroll mouse, a scroll 
and I've tried to scroll on that particular page. So it starts to transform and I start to uh, apply mathematical changes to the transform. And then translate is when I grab and move. So if I go and click on it and I move it, it actually has the same thing. So in that translate, in that uh, transform matrix, the, the first digit, the fourth, fifth and sixth digits apply to panning and zooming. And I then have to change the attribute, the transform attribute, to the transform matrix. And I have to go and change the stroke width, because if you zoom in, your lines get bigger as well. You don't want that, you want your lines to remain smaller. So I take the lines and I take their size and I divide them by the current zoom level. Um, and then I also have a tooltip. So this is a tooltip, I add a hidden div on the page, and that div I need to give it some information. So this one's a little tricky, and it's also one of those where it's probably easier just to use it than think about it too hard. But I don't know if anyone wants me to try and explain that one a bit more. You comfy? <laughs> yeah, stack overflow. Uh, okay, so there's functions that you can add, callback functions inside Java's inside D3. So on mouse over. So when I do a mouse over on that particular object, do this thing. So I make the tooltip visible and I tell it to explain the to change the text inside that tooltip to give us the ward name and the population name. If I move, then just move it with it. So D3 also has these handy things called the page Y and page X. It knows exactly where your mouse is on the page, and I can take those two bits of attributes and I can give the div tag those attributes to put it in that particular point. And when you move it away, just make it hidden. Um, yeah, and my zooming function is all built in there. So that gets us to the end of the build which is this guy. So now I have, as I pop over, I can have different wards, I can zoom in, I can drag it, move it into the middle, and things start to look a little bit better. So, this is the most densely populated. I could actually, probably based on the data, I have put the ward name as well. I just didn't think about it, I didn't realize I had that bit of information. But where are we? How good is your knowledge of that? Uh, I, I just want to challenge you on the color thing because it seems as if like, you know, people live there and there's just people, no people live there. There's no, there's no degrees. It's in the west. There's no, like here, there's just different color yellow and then it gets immediately to color. It just seems a bit. It seems a bit. The, the question around actually using something that has a better distribution of color would make sense because what you have in terms of urban population is you will have, uh, I mean, if you think about driving south of Joburg here, once you get past Goldbridge City and you start heading out towards the south, it gets very sparsely populated. Yeah. So you very quickly go from where there's people to where there's no people. I mean, you can have the, that degradation from 58,000 people living in that ward to 8,000 people living in that ward. So if I had this overlaid on top of a satellite map, it probably might make more sense because you would see that. But in terms of this is a, a fairly dense urban population, and this I think is actually uh, where was this so talking about yeah. No, that can't be. That's far too much more. I think it's might. This, yeah, it's further north. It's more towards Pretoria, north of Pretoria. Yeah. yeah. That's like no, that is so. How much problem? Social media. That's, yeah. the, that's the, the north. That's, that's the, the north. north, yeah. If you look at the, 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 the city this, centers, the green there. is the way to me. Yeah. yeah, that I think is the way to me. Does it count as one word? What? So that's, or, I mean, oh, that's a different word. Yeah. So, in a lot of this, the ward and the ward demarcations comes out of an election process in order to define where groups of people live. So, the sense that you have is that it should actually be fairly uniform because you want to actually try and make sure that you don't clump too many people um, into one particular ward. So, I think this is more political than it is geographic, which probably is going to explain why it doesn't look the way you expect it to look. Okay, one other thing to note in terms of the data is that. Um, for elections, you know, we don't use the census population as it is. We first have what we call eligible. From 16 up, up uh, uh, yeah. 
register, but we allow to go from 18 and above. So for, for, for us to get to that map, we're not going to use the census data as it is. We're going to use the register population. That's what the MDB uses, actually, the municipal delegation board. So it used to be it. It's like... I'm the IEC. I work for the oh, IEC. It sounded like this. But when I'm saying we, sometimes I also refer to the MDB because we work together when we prepare for the elections. As we speak now, they've got a certified voters roll from 2014, which they used to prepare for 2016. And they're going to regroup voting district. There's a smaller unit than the what's called a voting district, where we collect your names when you register to vote. And the MDB uses it to have a more general, more or less the same number of people in a ward, not necessarily as you see here. Yeah. thing that we have in the, the JSON file for from the demarcations board is the area. So you could also do um, population density as opposed to pure population numbers. And you're right, in terms of that, so in R is a thing in quantile, which allows you to break it into a particular set of breakpoints. So there are different ways that it could have been broken up more um, to make it a little bit more viable, but this was probably the easiest to explain. Um, Okay, so, to be honest, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to put this up onto the meetup. If you are getting stuck on D3, these are the four things that helped me the most in terms of getting my head around how it functions. So there's been certain complexity for me about D3 because it's not like JavaScript. It operates slightly differently. And these... These four particular ones, and actually most of this presentation comes from this last one, where Mike Bostock took us through making the same map for the UK. So I looked at, I copied some of the command line stuff from there. Um, and then also, uh, if you're on the meetup and you have any questions, um, we can start having that discussion. Um, I'm happy to help where I can. Are you going to share this? Yes. Yeah, I will. And then at the top is on GitHub. So I've actually got this code. So if you want to go and steal this code, I've got the population there. It's the full functioning interactive uh, process. You can just download it and play. There you go. So there's the data, there's the index, and it's there. Cool. All right. Any questions at the end?